Sometime between 1858 and 1861, in an orchard called Guaradzar, near Toledo in the middle of Spain, a hoard of buried treasure was discovered. This remarkable hoard consisted of 26 gold crowns, studded with gems, and a collection of gold crosses. Sadly, many of the items were stolen during the Spanish Civil War, but 10 of the crowns and a few of the crosses still remain, and they are now divided between the Musée de Cluny in Paris and the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid. The treasure dates from the 7th century, when Toledo was the centre of a flourishing Visigothic Christian kingdom that encompassed much of the Iberian Peninsula. The most impressive of the crowns was made for King Reconswinth, who died in 672. Of gold filigree work, it is sumptuously set with cabochon, sapphires and pearls. Hanging from the bottom are what are termed pendilia in Latin or prependulia in Greek, words that just mean fancy hanging bits. Why use a simple word when you can use a complicated one? On this crown, the dangly bits are gold chains set with rubies and more sapphires and incorporate filigree letters that spell out the words Recus Vinthus, Rex Offerit, Reconswinth Offered This. Given that the central pendilia has a cross dangling from it, presumably the king gave this crown to adorn a church. There was a similarly rich crown in the collection in Madrid that was sadly stolen in 1921. Again, of gold filigree work with sapphires and pearls, the letters of the pendilia stated that the crown was the gift of King Swinthilla, who died in the 630s. It was during his reign that the Visigothic kingdom came to dominate the whole of the Iberian Peninsula. One of the crowns in Paris gives us a little bit more of a clue to the original context in which these votive crowns were set. Rather less rich than that of the two kings, the crown is nevertheless a spectacular piece. Rather than filigree work, it is made of soldered gold plates. It is studded with cabochon rubies, sapphires, emeralds and opals. Round the base of the crown there are more pendant sapphires and in the centre is a single pendilium and from that is hanging a cross studded with stones. The cross has an inscription on the back which gives the context of the crown's making. In Domini Nomini Offered Sonica Sancta Maria in Sorbaces. In the name of the Lord, Sonica offers this to St Mary in Sorbaces. We have no idea who Sonica was, but from the quality of the gift, we can assume that they were either a member of the royal family or of the court. Presumably, St Mary in Sorbaches, which means St Mary in the Trees, was a church. A recent archaeological investigation on the site where the treasure was deposited and discovered in the 19th century has um, found uh, evidence of a large monastic enclosure there in the 7th century, including a stone-built basilica church, which may well be the Church of St Mary in Sobotches. A good deal of trouble was taken to hide the treasure. The treasure was buried in two graves. The corpse in the grave was removed, the treasure put into a cavity, and then the corpse replaced. This seems to have occurred at the beginning of the 8th century, when the Muslims begin to invade the Visigothic kingdom and eventually overthrow it. This part of Spain wouldn't be Christian again until the later Middle Ages, and nobody came back to retrieve the crowns. In offering votive crowns to be hung up in churches, the Visigothic elites were emulating a custom that had already been established elsewhere in the Christian world, particularly in the Byzantine Empire. The stones used in the crowns, sapphires, pearls, opals and rubies, are evidence of just how well connected Visigothic Spain was to the Christian East. The sophisticated culture of the Byzantine Empire was copied right around the Mediterranean would have been well known to the Visigoths, and the design of the crowns, as we shall see, shows considerable Byzantine influence. So how did this tradition of hanging up votive crowns in churches start in the Byzantine East? Well, it appears to begin in the very heart of the empire. Shortly after the construction of the great cathedral of Hagia Sophia in the imperial city of Constantinople, Votive crowns start to be left there by the Byzantine emperors and hung around the altar. 
Antony of Novgorod, who visited Hagia Sophia in the year 1200, four years before the Venetians sacked and looted it, describes their appearance. The crown of Constantine the Great, he says, decorated with pearls and precious stones, was hung in the centre under the Ciborium, the great canopy structure over the Holy Table, with a cross hanging from it with a golden dove under the cross. He records further that the crowns of the other emperors are also hung around the Ciborium, over the Holy Table, and that in addition there were a further 30 small crowns hung up to remind all Christians of the 30 pieces of silver to which Judas betrayed Christ. According to the chronicler Theophanes the Confessor, one of the crowns hung up there was the cause of a bit of a row. On Easter Day in the year 600, the Emperor Morris was given the gift of a precious crown by his wife Constantina and his mother-in-law, the Augusta Sophia. After looking at it, he took it straight to Hagia Sophia and had it hung above the holy table by a triple chain of gold and precious stones. Constantina and Sophia were so furious when they found out about this that they spent the rest of Easter in conflict with the emperor. Another crown that ended up above the altar in Hagia Sophia was that of the emperor Heraclius. It had been buried with him, but was removed from his corpse by the emperor Constance II and used as a coronation crown and then later suspended above the holy table. How were these crowns arranged above the altar? Well, in the late 6th century church of Santa Polinaria in Classe in Ravenna, a major imperial city, St Ursicinus, the founder of the church, is portrayed in mosaic, holding the book of the Gospels and standing between the columns of an altar ciborium. Above him is a rail with drawn curtains that were pulled around the altar during the liturgy, and in the middle of the rail is a suspended votive crown. There are no pendilia on this crown, but the gold circlet, studded with gems and hung from golden chains, doesn't look dissimilar to the crown of Reconswinth. Further evidence can be found in a manuscript of the Gospels in the Dumbarton Oaks Byzantine collection. This Gospel book dates from the first half of the 12th century and was produced in Constantinople. The text of the canon tables in the book are framed within a structure that looks a lot like an altar ciborium, a canopy with columns and arches. On two of the pages, tiny little votive crowns are shown hanging from the capitals of the column from iron hooks. These crowns have shallow arches, and below each there is a single pendilium with either a cross or a dove hanging from it. These crowns look very similar indeed to the Holy Crown of Hungary, the Hungarian coronation crown, a Byzantine crown dating from the 1070s. This crown has pendilia, but they are on the sides of the crown only, so it can be easily worn. One Byzantine imperial votive crown does survive, and it is now in the treasury of St Mark's in Venice. How it got there is not entirely clear. The crown, which now forms the bottom part of an object called the Grotto of Our Lady, is late 9th or early 10th century, and was probably commissioned by the Emperor Leo VI. The band of the crown originally had 13 enamel randals on it, of which only seven now remain. One portrays the Emperor Leo himself, five are of the Apostles, and the remaining one is of the evangelist Mark. It is quite plausible that this crown was among those that had been hung up in Hagia Sophia and that it arrived in Venice as part of the booty taken by the Venetians when they sacked Constantinople in 1204. It is equally likely, in my opinion, given that it has the patron saint of Venice on it, St Mark, to have been a gift from Leo to St Mark's Basilica. Venice in his time still had a large pro-Byzantine population. It is clear from the holes in the rim of the crown that it was intended to be suspended and the eyelets at the bottom at spaced intervals suggest that there were pendelia hanging from it too. So what precisely were these mighty men and women doing when they offered precious crowns to be hung up in great churches as votive offerings? I think the purpose and meaning behind these crowns is complex. In the first instance, they were there to add magnificence and honour to the altar. 
They would have been seen from the main body of the church and must have added a sparkle, splendour and colour that would have drawn the eye to the holy table and enhanced the visual richness of the divine liturgy celebrated there. The liturgy is the place in which the people receive the King of Kings sacramentally, and the crowns above the altar recall the church's belief that the King of all is made present on the altar in the bread and wine. Some of these crowns, such as those of Constantine and of Morris, either were worn or were intended to be worn. And there is a clear symbolic value to a king or emperor making a bold gesture and giving up his own crown in the service of the church. A recognition that Christ's authority is greater than his own and that he owes his temporal power to God's providence. The crowns from Visigothic Spain and that of Leo VI are rather too small to have been worn. The elaborate pendilio would have made them impractical to wear in any case. They are perhaps thank offerings for Christ's blessing on them and a recognition of the source of their authority again. But they are perhaps too an indication of a king's favour for a particular church and a mark of affection for it. Some of these votive crowns were given as particular thank offerings. Theophanes recounts that the Empress Irene, after being cured of a haemorrhage, dedicated to Hagia Sophia, veils woven of gold and curtains of gold thread, as well as a crown and vessels for the bloodless sacrifice decorated with precious stones and pearls. Once dedicated, these objects were, of course, considered holy, and were betide the emperor or king who tried to snatch that which had been given to God. Theophanes tells us that the Emperor Leo IV, who died in the year 780, the husband of Irene, died from a fever or plague after seizing from above the altar in Hagia Sophia the crown of Heraclius. After the death of her husband, Irene returned the crown and it was hung once again above the altar in the great church and all was well. These beautiful, rich and fascinating objects were complex offerings. If you enjoy this channel, you're bound to enjoy my magazine, The Antiquary. Published every month, it is a labour of love for me, and in it I explore some of the more obscure aspects of our shared history, all beautifully illustrated in full colour. It chips across the world, is offered in print and digital format, and readers give it five stars on Google. If you love your history like me, particularly the history of objects, buildings, people and places, why not consider subscribing? Subscribing helps support my work and the channel too. There's a link above and in the video description that takes you to the magazine website. Mm -hmm.